friends in the previous lecture we have uh, introduced the basic concepts of probability theory then uh, i gave two definitions of uh, probability one i called as a classical definition and another one is the relative frequency definition of the probability uh, and uh, we have seen their uh, relative merits and demerits so later on there was a need of a, a strong as axiomatic framework under which the probability function will be valid under the given conditions so this uh, development was uh, is it is attributed to the russian mathematician a n kolmogorov now we have already seen that the basic unit of a random experiment is the sample space now along with the sample space we consider a subset of the class of uh, a class of subsets of the sample space and we impose certain condition on that class which we call that it is closed under a complementation and it is also closed under the uh, unions countable unions therefore this structure which we call as a sigma field together with the sample space we call it a measurable space so let us consider let omega b b a measurable space so we have the following axiomatic definition axiomatic definition of probability so we say probability is a set function because for every event we are defining a probability and now what is an event event is a subset here subset of omega now this b is the class of subsets of class of subsets of omega and we are assuming that this is a sigma field it is a sigma field so on each set we are defining or we can say we are associating a number which is called p of that p of a earlier in classical definition we have seen p a we are writing as m by n then similarly in the second case of relative frequency definition we are writing it as limit of p n by n as n tends to infinity so a certain number is associated with the set a so it's a set function so probability is a set function so we call it from b into r satisfying the following three axioms so first axiom is that probability of every event is non negative second is probability of the whole sample space is 1 third for any pair wise disjoint sets e1 e2 and so on belonging to b probability of union ei is equal to sum of the probabilities i is equal to 1 to infinity so the first axiom is called the axiom of non negativity the second axiom is the theorem uh, the axiom of completeness or the axiom of totality because we are fixing that the total probability cannot be more than 1 so it is equal to 1 here and this is countable additivity so now omega b p this is called a probability space that means our measurable space omega the sample space omega a class of events and the probability function along with that this is called a probability space 
Now, certain consequences of uh, or ramifications of this definition are as follows. Certain ramifications of the definition, the axiomatic definition, so which will follow easily. So, for example, we may easily conclude that probability of a empty set is 0. How? See, we may take say in the axiom 3, here we are having events e 1, e 2, etcetera. Suppose I take one event only and all other events I take to be phi then what will happen e 2, e 3 and so on these to be phi in axiom 3. Then what we will get left hand side will become e 1, the right hand side will become e 1 plus probability of phi plus probability of phi and so on. Now what we are getting is we may put e 1 is equal to omega. If we put e 1 is equal to omega, then we will get p omega that is 1 is equal to p omega plus p phi plus p phi and so on. Now, this is also 1. So, this cancels out and you are getting p phi which is a non-negative number, it must be equal to 0. Similarly, you may conclude that if E 1, E 2, E n are pairwise disjoint sets in B, then probability of union E i, i is equal to 1 to n that is finitely additive, p is finitely additive. The proof is again very simple because here we can take e 1, e 2, e n and the remaining e i is to be phi and then since p phi is 0, this will lead to this. The proof will follow from axiom 3 by taking e n plus 1 is equal to e n plus 2 and so on equal to phi and using p phi is equal to 0. We also have some uh, further things. For example, if we say that an event is having more favorable outcomes, then the event should have a higher probability of occurrence. So, this type of property should also follow from the axiomatic definition. So, for example, if we say if E is a subset of F, then probability of E should be less than or equal to probability of F. Now, the proof of this is very simple actually. We can look at say a Venn diagram representation. Suppose this is event F, this is event E. So, if we write F as union of E and union of F minus E, we can write F as E union F minus E. Then easily you can say that these are disjoint. So, probability of F becomes probability of E plus probability of F minus E. Now, here you can see that this is a probability of certain event, therefore, this is going to be non-negative, therefore, this is greater than or equal to probability of E. Also, you can see here that a sub corollary of this 
if E is a subset of F, then probability of F minus E is equal to probability of F minus probability of E. Further, you can observe that since every E belonging to B has E subset of omega, this means that probability of E will always be less than or equal to probability of omega that is 1. In the first axiom, we are having P E greater than or equal to 0. Now, we are also having that it is less than or equal to 1. Another easy consequence you can see that if I consider any event E and if I consider its complement, then this is equal to omega. Now, if you apply the additive property, then it will give probability of E plus probability of E complement is equal to 1. That means, if I know the probability of one event, I can easily obtain the probability of the complementary event. Further, we can see let E and F be any two events. That means, if I look at suppose this is my sample space and A and B are any E and F are any two general events. Then you can see this E union F if I look at then E union F I can represent as union of two parts. We can write E union F is equal to E union this portion this portion we can express as f minus e intersection f again we have split the e union f into two disjoint regions e and f minus e intersection f these two are disjoint because this portion is e and this is f minus e intersection f therefore the additive uh, additivity will be holding and we get probability of E union F as probability of E plus probability of F minus probability of E intersection F. Now, again observe this E intersection F portion, this is actually a subset of F. So, if we apply this that if E is a subset of F, then the probability of difference is equal to the difference of the probabilities. Then using this, we can say that probability of f minus e intersection f should be equal to probability f minus probability e intersection f. So, we are getting probability of E union f is equal to probability E plus probability f minus probability of E intersection f. So, this is called addition rule. Roughly you can explain it like this that if there are any two events then the probability of the union will be equal to the sum and since in the sum the common portion is added twice. So, we have to remove it once. Now, this fact has an easy generalization for example, in place of uh, 2 if we have 3 suppose we have 3 events A, B, C suppose this is say E, F and G and we want to find out the probability of E union F union G. Then if I consider this full thing E, then in F I have to remove E intersection F and then in G both of these portions are removed. Now, consequently this portion is removed twice which is E intersection F intersection G. So, for three events then we will have the formula for any three events E, F and G we have probability of E union F union G is equal to probability E plus probability F plus probability of G minus probability of E intersection F minus probability of F intersection G minus probability of E intersection G plus probability of E intersection F intersection G. 
So, based on this we have the general addition rule. for any events e 1, e 2, e n. <coughs> Probability of union e i, i is equal to 1 to n is equal to sigma probability of e i subtracting 2 at a time then adding 3 at a time and so on. Next you will be subtracting 4 at a time and so on minus 1 to the power n plus 1 probability of intersection i is equal to 1 to n. This is the general addition rule. The proof can be easily obtained by using induction because we have already seen that the result is true for 2. So, for n is equal to 1 it is trivial, trivially true for n is equal to 2 we have already seen. So, if we write for n plus 1 you split into up to n and then take one additional that is union e i i is equal to 1 to n union e n plus 1. Apply the formula for 2 and in the previous portion you apply the formula which you have assumed for n. Then the result will come. I am skipping the proof here. However, it is available in the uh, standard textbooks and also in my other lectures on probability and statistics. Now, we look at certain other important uh, ramifications of the axiomatic definition. Since we are, we can talk about large number of events, we can talk about the sequence of events also. So, when we talk about the sequence of the events, there is a concept of the limit. For example, we may have sequence of sets such that E 1 is subset of E 2, E 2 is a subset of E 3 and so on. These are known as monotonically increasing sequence of events. Similarly, we may have monotonically decreasing sequence like E 1 could contain E 2, E 2 may contain E 3 and so on. These are known as monotonically decreasing. Now, whenever we have a monotonic sequence, the limits exist. That means, limit of a monotonically increasing sequence that is equal to the union the limit of a decreasing sequence will be its intersection. So, we define what is known as monoton sequences. So, E i is said to be monotonic increasing if E 1 is a subset of E 2 is a subset of E 3 and so on. In this case, limit of the sequence is defined to be union of E i. Similarly, if E i is said to be monotonic decreasing if E 1 contains E 2 contains E 3 and so on. In this case, the limit of the sequence turns out to be intersection of all the sets. Then we have the following result. Let E i be a monotonic sequence of events, then probability of limit E i 
is equal to limit of the probability that is known as the continuity assumption uh, continuity result for the probability that is the probability is also a continuous function i am skipping the proofs of these results uh, because of the lack of uh, time in this particular course the probability we have proved that if i consider two events then probability of a union b is equal to probability a plus probability b minus probability a intersection b so we are subtracting from the sum a certain number so that means it is less than or equal to probability a plus probability b so in general if i consider any number of events then for any events ei is belonging to b probability of union ei is always less than or equal to sigma probability of ei no matter what this union is this union may be finite it could be infinite union also this is known as the subadditivity property of the probability function next we proceed to the concept of conditional probability conditional probability so let us consider an example let two dice let me assume they are fair be tossed okay let us consider say a to be an event that the sum is even and we put an event say b that the number on the first is less than 4 let us look at the probabilities of these events what is the probability of a in the sample space there will be 36 possibilities out of which 18 possibilities would lead to the even sum for example 1 1 1 three that means if both are odd or both are even if that is happening then the sum will be even so the probability of a will be half let's look at what is the probability of b that the sum on the first is less than 4 Uh, sorry the number on the first is less than 4 now number on the first first means that first die has the possibilities 1 2 3 4 5 6 6 so 1 2 3 are the favorable outcomes here along with that all the outcomes of the second one are associated once again there are 18 outcomes that are possible that is equal to half now let us look at what is the probability of a given b i am considering this is something different that means given that b has occurred now what does it mean it means that we know already that the number on the first is less than 4 then what is the probability that the sum is even now let's look at the possibilities the first number is less than 4 that means number could be 1 2 R three. Now, what is the possibility for the second one? It could be one one, one three, one five. For two, it will be two, two, two four, two six. For three, it will be three 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 one, three three, and three six. That is three. There are total nine possibilities. There are total nine possibilities out of the total possibilities of b that is equal to 
18. So, this number turns out to be 18 that is equal to half. Now, let me modify this example. I say that the event A I modify, my event A is now say that the here I am considering the B to be the number on the first is less than 4 and I consider A to be the event that the number on the first is even. Okay. Now, let us see what are the possibilities of the A now out of the possibilities of B. The B is giving the possibilities that numbers are 1, 2, 3 and the first one is also even then 1, 2, 1, 4 sorry. So, this will not be considered here because the number on the first is less than 4 is 1, 2, 3, but the even possibility is only one possibility here. So, total number of possibilities will become only 1 by 3. What is the probability of A given B that will be equal to 1 by 3. Whereas, what is the probability of A? The probability of A was half. What is the probability of B? That was equal to half. Now, you see the probability of A is actually half here. What is the probability that the number on the first uh, die is even? The probability is half. But if we know that the event B that is the number on the first is less than 4 has already occurred, then the probability of A gets modified because out of the possibilities of B only 3 possibilities are there. Here only one possibility corresponds to the occurrence of A. So, the probability of A given B becomes 1 by 3. This is the concept of conditional probability. That means, if we are having certain prior knowledge about the occurrence of event, then that may have an effect on the probability of occurrence of another event. So, the ultimate probability of that may get changed. Basically, it means that the sample space has reduced. So, let us formally define the conditional probability that let omega b p b a probability space and let f be an event with probability of f positive then for any event E, we define the conditional probability of E given that F has already occurred as probability of E given F, this is the notation and it is defined as probability of E intersection F divided by probability of F. One can check that this concept is satisfying the axioms of the probability. That means, it is a non-negative function. The probability of omega, suppose I take omega here, then this will become omega intersection F divided by F. Now, omega intersection F is F. So, this ratio will become 1 and uh, if I consider uh, countable sequence E 1, E 2 and so on, then if I consider the probability of union E i given F, then probability of union E i intersection F will become distributed here and then it will become equal to the sum. So, the, the basic axioms of probability are valid for this new definition which we call conditional probability. So, this definition is uh, justified. Now, let us look at the further ramifications of this definition also. So, we can write like this. So, this implies probability of E intersection F, we can write as probability of F into probability of E given F. See, as alternative, we may have 
probability of E intersection F also as probability of E into probability of F given E provided this conditional probability is well defined. That means, if probability of E is positive in that case we may write like this in place of this. Now, what does this, uh, this statement or this event rep uh, statement represent? This represents that probability of a simultaneous occurrence of two events E and F is equal to the probability of one of them into the probability of conditioning on the other one. Okay? If we look at the second one that is also the same, this is the probability of the simultaneous occurrence and this is equal to the probability of occurrence of E into the probability of conditional occurrence of F. This simple statement is known as the famous multiplication rule of probability. Multiplication rule of probability. Now, naturally, this can be further generalized. In place of two events, we may have three events, we may have n events. So, we write the general multiplication rule. the general multiplication rule. Let us consider events E 1, E 2, E n, n events are there and we assume because we, if we have to define the conditional probabilities then the probabilities of those conditioning events should be positive. So, we take the smallest one that probability of say intersection E i, i is equal to 1 to n to be positive. Then the probability of simultaneous occurrence of this can be represented as probability of say E 1 into probability of E 2 given E 1 into probability of say E 3 given E 1 intersection E 2 and so on probability of E n given intersection E i, i is equal to 1 to n minus 1. The proof is very simple. In fact, it can be proved by induction once again. Let me demonstrate this proof here. So, for n is equal to 1, the statement is trivially true and for n is equal to 2, it is true by the definition of conditional probability. So, assume it for n is equal to k and then let us consider n is equal to k plus 1. So, we look at the probability of intersection a i, i is equal to 1 to k plus 1. What we do? We represent it as a 1 intersection a 2 intersection a i, i is equal to 1 to i is equal to 3 to k plus 1. So, we are considering this as 1 and these as another k minus uh, 1 events. So, this total number of events becomes k because this I am treating as 1 in t t. So, this becomes probability of a 1 intersection a 2 into probability of a 3 given a 1 intersection a 2 and so on probability of a k plus 1 given intersection a j, j is equal to 1 to k. Now, the first one again we can write as probability of a 1 into probability of a 2 given a 1 into probability of a 3 given a 1 intersection a 2 and so on.
So, this proves the general multiplication rule. Now, next we look at the theorem of total probability. Let say F one, F two, F n be a priori events with probability of F i positive and uh, F i intersection F j be equal to phi for i not equal to j and say union of f i i is equal to 1 to n b equal to omega. That means, the events are mutually exclusive each with positive probability and they are exhaustive events. Then for any event e probability of E can be written as probability of E given F i into probability of F i. So, actually the meaning of uh, this a priori means that we are considering something like that event E is observed after F i s have occurred. So, as a consequence of either of F i s E could have occurred. In that case, the probability of the final occurrence of E can be considered as a sum of the probabilities of individual occurrences of E through F i s each of that means, what is the probability that it would have been caused by F 1, what is the probability that E would have been caused by F 2 and so on. And then we multiply by the individual probabilities of F 1, F 2 also. So, Let us look at the proof of this. Uh, proof is not difficult. In fact, we simply use that these are mutually exclusive and exhaustive events. So, we can write E as E intersection omega, where omega is a sample space, and then this omega we can express as union F i i is equal to 1 to n. Now, here we can apply the distributive properties of unions and intersections. So, you get union i is equal to 1 to n e intersection f i. Now, if f i s are disjoint, then e intersection f i s are also going to be disjoint. So, this can be written as sigma probability of e intersection f i i is equal to 1 to n. Now, on this we can apply the multiplication rule. So, we get this as sigma probability of E given F i into probability of F i i is equal to 1 to n. Now, easily you can see that in place of n that is a finite number of events, if the same thing was true for an infinite number of events that means, they were pairwise disjoint and exhaustive, then the same statement would have been true if n is replaced by infinite. So, let me write it as a remark. the statement of the theorem remains valid if we have an infinite number of events that is union f i i is equal to 1 to infinity is equal to omega. So, the result will be still true. Now, one may look at it in a slightly different way. Here we are looking at E as a consequence of f i. So, we want to know that what is the probability or what is the chance of the consequence E and this E could have been caused by either of f i's. 
Now, suppose we observe the outcome, then what is the probability that it was caused by say f 1 or by f 2? That means, we look at it in the reverse way. Here I am calling f i's to be a priori events. Therefore, and these a priori probabilities of these are known and uh, these uh, conditional probabilities of these are also known and we are able to calculate the probability of E. But suppose we know that E has occurred, what is the probability of say F 1 or what is the probability of F 2? This reverse looking at this result is known as the famous Bayes theorem. So, the conditions are the same let f 1, f 2, f n be a priori events with probability of f i greater than 0, f i intersection f j is equal to phi i not equal to j union f i is equal to omega that means mutually exclusive and exhaustive events. Let E be an E event with probability E positive, then probability of say F j given E that is equal to probability of E given F j into probability of F j divided by sigma probability of E given F i into probability of F i, i is equal to 1 to n. This result is known as Bayes theorem named after Reverend Thomas Bayes. The proof is uh, based on the definition of the conditional probability and the theorem of total probability. So, we can express the conditional probability of f j given E as probability of f j intersection E divided by probability of E. Now, the numerator you can just apply the multiplication rule and in the denominator apply the theorem of total probability. And once again we can notice that in place of uh, finite number of events, even if we have infinite number of events with the same condition, then the result will be true. Once again the statement of the theorem. remains valid if we have an infinite number of events f i's and they should satisfy the same criteria. Let me explain this uh, through one or two examples here. So, in a production line ICs are packed in vials of 5 and sent for inspection. The probabilities that the number of
defectives in a while is 0, 1, 2 or 3, these probabilities are 1 by 3, 1 by 4, 1 by 4 and 1 by 6 respectively. So, a while has 5 ICs. Okay? Now, out of this 5, there can be no defective with probability 1 by 3, there can be 1 defective with probability 1 by 4, there can be 2 defective with probability 1 by 4 and there can be 3 defectives with the probability 1 by 6. Now, 2 ICs are drawn at random from a while and found to be good. What is the probability that all ICs in this while are good. So, these events are a priori events that the while may have 0, 1, 2, 3 defectives. However, now we are looking at posteriori that means we are already knowing the outcome that out of one while which is selected and we tested two out of that and they turn out to be good. So, we already know the final outcome. Now, what is the probability that my initial event was that it had 0 defective vials. So, this is a clear cut case of the application of the Bayes theorem. Let us see this. So, define events B i saying that i defectives in the while. This is for i is equal to 0, 1, 2, 3 because these are the only four possibilities, then you are having that B i's are disjoint, pairwise disjoint and union of B i is equal to omega. And let us consider say A to be the event that two i c's which are selected they are good. Now, let us look at the a priori probabilities, probability of B naught is 1 by 3, probability of B 1 is 1 by 4, probability of B 2 is 1 by 4, probability of B 3 is 1 by 6. So, these are the probabilities that are already given to us. Now, we can also calculate the following probabilities that is probability of A given B naught. Now, this means that what is the conditional probability that the two randomly selected vials are good given that the while had no defectives. Certainly, if there were no defectives, so whatever you choose it is supposed to be good. So, the probability will be 1. Let us look at what is the probability of A given B 1. B 1 means that the while had one defective. However, when we select two both are good that means both are from the four good ones there are total five there are total five out of which two are selected however we are selecting from the two good ones the two from the good ones only that means they are selected from four only now this number of course you can simplify that is 3c5 3 by 5 similarly if you look at a given b2 this event represents that the while had two bad ones, two defectives, however, we did not choose them. So, the selection is out of three good ones, out of the total selection of two from the five. This number simplifies to say 3 by 10. Similarly, we can look at what is the probability of A given B 3 that is equal to now the while had three defectives. However, we did not choose them that means we got the only remaining good ones 
out of total selection of 5C2. This number is 1 by 10. Now, let us look at various possibilities. For example, what is the probability of A? So, the probability of A, this will be equal to sigma probability of A given B i into probability of B i. This is by theorem of total probability. That means, what is the probability that the two items which are selected at random from the selected while they are good. So, this will be based on a priori ones that means, whether the initial ones were having 0, 1, 2 or 3 defectives. Now, these numbers we have already calculated. So, it becomes simply 1 into 1 by 3 plus 3 by 5 into 1 by 4 plus 3 by 10 into 1 by 4 plus 1 by 10 into 1 by 6. And uh, if we want to calculate what is the probability of say all ICs in this while are good, that means we are interested to find out the probability of B naught given A that is equal to probability of A given B naught into probability of B naught divided by probability of A that is the theorem of total probability. So, this numerator value then turns out to be 1 into 1 by 3 divided by the denominator that is probability of A, which after simplification turns out to be 40 by 69. Let me briefly define the concept of independence of events. We have defined the conditional probability that A given B, it is equal to probability of A intersection B divided by probability of B. Now, if this is equal to probability of A, that means if the conditional probability of A given B is equal to unconditional probability of A, then we should say that B has no effect on A and we can say A is independent of B. Now, if you write down this condition probability of A intersection B divided by probability B is equal to probability A, it is becoming probability of A intersection B is equal to probability A into probability of B. Now, that is reducing to that probability of A that is the prob probability of the simultaneous occurrence is equal to product of the probabilities. So, we can define two events a and B are said to be independent if probability of A intersection B is equal to probability A into probability of B. Now, likewise we can generalize this definition. If I have three events, three events A, B, C are said to be independent if probability of A intersection B intersection C is equal to probability of A into probability B into probability C. But this is not enough. Actually, we need some more conditions. A and B should be pairwise independent. A and C should be pairwise independent, B and C should be pairwise independent. Then this will be said to be independent and we add the word here mutually independent here. That means, in general if I have n events, then for the independence I will have to write the condition taking 2 at a time. 3 at a time, 4 at a time and all of them at a time. In general, then we will say A 1 
a2 an are mutually independent if probability of ai intersection aj is equal to probability of ai into probability of aj for i less than j probability of ai intersection aj intersection ak is equal to probability of ai into probability of aj into probability of ak i less than j less than k probability of and so on probability of intersection ai i is equal to 1 to n is equal to product of the probability ai i is equal to 1 to n also it is clear from here that unless all the conditions are satisfied we cannot say the events are independent so for example if i am talking about three events it may happen that say this condition is satisfied or this condition is satisfied or this condition is satisfied but this condition need not be satisfied similarly maybe this condition is satisfied and this condition is satisfied but these two conditions are not satisfied so unless all the conditions which are given for the mutual independence of all the events then we will not say that the events are independent because it could happen that a and b are independent a and c may also be independent but along with b and c a may become dependent that means b and c together may be able to determine what is a now this type of phenomena is observed in various statistical uh, experiments uh, i may be giving some examples of these phenomena in the next classes.